ڈی at the Cato Institute and Jack Melji, Senior Policy Analyst, Immigration and Workforce Policy at Bipartisan Policy Center. Cyrus Mehta, Immigration Lawyer and the Founder and Managing Partner of Cyrus Mehta and Partners kindly watched the briefing. Dr. BMS and your moderator and co-organizer of this event, along with Sunita Sorachi and Sandy Kips. Today's briefing topic is a century of green card backlog cripples the immigration system and threatens the U.S. economy. Can it be fixed? Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm David Beer, the Associate Director of Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute. Cato Institute has been here in Washington, D.C. as a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit research organization uh, dedicated to the principles of free markets, limited government, and individual liberty. Uh, we produce original research on a broad range of topics, including immigration for the last uh, 40 years. And uh, that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, a century of immigration restrictions. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see it. Give me the thumbs up if you can. Hopefully you guys can see my presentation. Give me a thumbs up if you can, please. Yes. Great. So I'm Jack Malday. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Bipartisan Policy Center. I work on immigration and workforce policy. And for those of you who don't know about the Bipartisan Policy Center or BPC, uh, we are a DC-based think tank and we're, we're a mission-focused organization helping policymakers work across party lines to craft bipartisan solutions. So we connect Republicans and Democrats, we deliver data and context, negotiating public policy, and creating space for bipartisan collaboration. And we, our aim is to help turn legislators' best ideas into durable laws that improve lives. So today I'm going to take you through a report that we published last year in November called Green Light to Growth, Estimating the Economic Benefits of Clearing Green Card Backlogs. So this focuses on the, the economics of the issue. And uh, David took us through uh, the history and how restrictive the annual green card limits are. And in the report, we, we highlight two key drivers of the green card backlogs. So firstly, it's those annual limits, creating what we call a cap-based backlog. And you can see in this diagram here that uh, we have multiple limits. So we have uh, a total limit, and we have specific family-based and employment-based limits. There's a diversity lottery limit. And then there are further limits even within these limits. So it's a very convoluted and restrictive system. And David mentioned as well that we have these country-specific limits, uh, no more than 7% of, of the family-based and employment-based allowances can go to any one country. And uh, the second driver of the green card backlog that we consider is the processing backlog. So this exists because uh, agencies such as the State Department and USCIS don't have enough resources to process all of the pending cases. And I should say in our paper, we consider the family-based and employment-based green card backlogs. Uh, obviously, there are other backlogs as well, which David ran through. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm, I'm really uh, privileged to be with um, esteemed co-panelists, David Beer and Jack uh, Maldi. I do not have a PowerPoint with statistics because I'm going to talk about the human aspect of immigration. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I work in the trenches. 
And even though I can deal with statistics, I'm dealing with clients and people all the time, and I'm dealing with their families too, all the time. Now, David and Jack have both um, explained in very elaborately the backlogs in our immigration system. And especially David highlighted the backlogs in the employment-based green card system, especially for Indian-born beneficiaries. He has estimated that the backlog could be a lifetime, a century, which is unbelievable um, for new people who are filing for green cards today, who are being sponsored by employers because of their skills. They've come in on temporary visas like an H-1. And prior to that, they came as students, foreign students graduated from top U.S. universities. And when they get sponsored for a green card, they're in these backlogs that will last forever. And it's frustrating, to say the least. Even though they can remain in the U.S. legally, it's difficult to remain in status, getting extension after extension after extension. But there is frustration because at the end of this whole process, they continue to remain non-immigrants, bound to employers. And in the process, the U.S. loses. And many of these people get frustrated and go to other countries. The United States is not the only game in town. There are other countries that offer much, much more attractive immigration benefits and systems. And um, Canada next door is, of course, uh, trying to attract the folks here who don't get their green cards, who get capped out of the H-1B visas. And so uh, the U.S. may not be able to maintain its leadership in the world with respect to attracting the best and brightest immigrants. I want to also talk about families because people come with families. They have, the, you have the principal beneficiary of a visa petition who's being sponsored for a green card and you have a spouse and you have children. If the children are born in the United States, that's great. But a lot of folks come in with their families. So when they come in on a temporary visa, the principal beneficiary gets the H-1B visa. There are other non-immigrant visas like the L-1 intra-company transfer visa or the O-1 visa, but let's focus on H-1 visas, which is the workhorse of employment-based visas. The principal gets the H-1B, the spouse gets the H-4 visa, and so does the child. The child can only remain on the H-4 dependent visa until the age of 21. And we know the backlogs are horrendous. So when the employer starts the green card process for an Indian-born beneficiary, the child, even if the child is two years today in H-4 status, the child will probably age out. The child is not going to be able to get the green card with the parent because a child would have turned 21. There is um, a, a, a law called the Child Status Protection Act. I'm asked to give my language here. Is that for me? No, no, no. Okay. So the child will not be able to take advantage of the Child Status Protection Act because by the time the date becomes current, when the parent is going to receive the green card, the child may have already crossed 21, so the child won't be protected. The age won't be protected. Uh, it's a very complicated formula. And when this child gets left out, and we have clients where the child is now turning 21 or has turned 21, they can't remain on this dependent visa. They could have gone to college on that age 4 visa, but now they have to switch to an F1 student visa when they turn 21 and they're not protected by the Child Status Protection Act. And then it creates perils for the child and tension for the family because the student F1 visa requires the holder to have a non-immigrant intent, an intent to return back to the foreign country. And you can imagine how can a child who's been here for, the, for their whole life be able to establish that they're gonna return home. There has been a slight relaxation in this whole 
that's all for now keep watching desi tv usa please like subscribe share and comment and don't forget to watch our channel dtv and then uh, log on to our ott platform dtv flicks to explore over 2000 channels which we provide